Cool. So, what is Project RIA? Uh, RIA is an effort that a bunch of people around Particle Labs uh, started on in about January. Um, and it is an effort to sort of take another iteration at the current IPFS.io gateways. So, to understand that, that context, like I did on the keynote two days ago, I'm going to dive into what is going on with the gateways so that we can understand what we might want to change with them. So I had a, a picture that looks sort of like this. And this is, this is the, the sort of bulk of requests that are coming in uh, to, the, to the gateways right now. And so that's where it's meaningful us, for us to, to take some effort to try and change it. You've got a bunch of requests. There are a set of different uh, actual requests that get made. But sort of the most common ones look like IPFS slash SID. Um, some of these have some sort of other things going on around them. They may use an IPNI domain where they've got a custom domain, and so we have to consider and factor that in. There's some you know, edges that go over and ask for API v0 and some other sort of edge cases. Um, and we may have some like things around this SID. So some requests ask for uh, a raw block or a car file version of content directly. Uh, and some uh, requests will not ask directly for the SID, but will use the SID to point to sort of a directory and then ask for a file within that directory. So they'll have a path afterwards. These requests come into a load balancer. Right now, Protocol Labs, uh, for the gateway that we run at IPFS.io, uh, has uh, seven points of presence uh, in Equinix uh, data centers around the world. Uh, requests will come in, they'll hit an Nginx load balancer that will distribute back to uh, a, a bank or a set of Kubo IPFS nodes uh, that then handle fractions of those requests. Um, these IPFS nodes right now are provisioned with pretty big caches. Um, think, you know, at least hundreds of gigs of block store. And they're actually serving many of these requests directly from their disk, right? So, so a lot of requests um, where we're having those direct IPFS nodes just sort of, they already know what that SID is and are able to directly serve it. And when they don't, they, they act like a normal IPFS node. Uh, they go to the DHT, they figure out other clients that might have it, uh, or they use, in many cases, their existing bit swap connections um, because we've got relatively high connection limits, so they stay connected to many peers, and so they'll ask over those ambient bit swap connections to find other IPFS nodes that have the content, fetch it over bit swap, uh, bring it back. The other thing to think about, right, is where, where is this happening? If we were to access the gateway today, uh, the closest uh, data center that, that there is an IPFS.io termination in uh, is up in Amsterdam. Uh, we're down in Brussels. But when we look at like, the route, if you were to trace route, you would see that, that the first thing that happens is that traffic goes to the data center that's about five blocks up from us. So there, there is uh, that, that data center that you can see uh, in yellow up there. That's the, the Brussels uh, commercial internet exchange. Our traffic is going from the final metro fiber that exists in this city, terminates and transfers over to a long distance carrier that then takes it up to the Equinix data center. But if you were to look at most other CDNs, Cloudflare, Netflix, et cetera, they're gonna terminate right in, in the Brussels city center. And so if we're thinking about how do we make this faster, the thing we'd really like to figure out is some structure for your request to IPFS.io to also terminate at that local data center or that local internet exchange, right? You, you'd like to have the, the five, 10 millisecond termination and response to your traffic, especially for common files, rather than that taking 15, 20 milliseconds here. And you know, in general, people will say something like up to 50 milliseconds to get to a data center for your region. Right? And so in the structure we've got right now, where we've got these large block stores that sort of need to live in a data center, if, if Protocol Labs was to go and say, OK, instead of having you know, seven points of presence, we're going to you know, get 50, we'd still be in big data centers. We'd still be 50 milliseconds away from things. And it would cost a lot. And so we need to figure out, is there some way for us to get this faster speed without it, <clears throat> you know, being orders of magnitude more cost to just have that centralized infrastructure. So what, what would a decentralized alternative look like? How, how do we find ways to get to a lower latency for most requests without it being 
us running a lot of Nginx and a lot of Kubo nodes in uh, not only data centers, but also these metro city level uh, pops or internet exchanges. So the good news is that uh, from last fall, Protocol Labs launched uh, a CDN, uh, an incentivized, decentralized, incentivized and decentralized CDN called Saturn. Um, and so we might think we can put in Saturn instead of this middle layer of Nginx and Kubo, right? We, we've got on the order of a couple thousand nodes there. They're much closer to, uh, to the end users uh, from the measurements that we've got. Um, and, and so instead of having to, to hit that, you're hopefully uh, hitting some local Saturn endpoint. And then you'd like that Saturn endpoint to be able to fetch from the backing uh, IPFS node, Filecoin node, uh, or other source of content address data. So that's been the basic sort of path that we've been trying to follow is how do we make Saturn work uh, to, to replace this Nginx Kubo mix that we've been using as, as protocol labs for our gateways. Um, this is a lot of people uh, that have been involved in this. I probably missed some, uh, but I just wanted to try and get as many of, of the people who've been involved in doing work on this as I could up here because it's, it's, it's a much bigger effort than me. Uh, I'm just trying to provide sort of a general summary and direction. So we got given three sort of joint goals to, to, or goals to jointly optimize around. Um, it, it's not, we're going to do one thing, but we want to do a combination of these three, and we've got some flexibility. One is that we want Filecoin retrievals to become a first class citizen, uh, equivalent to IPFS retrievals that the gateways do today. So right now, when we look at that path of Nginx going to Kubo, we've got BitSwap really managing a lot of the, the peer selection and how things are going to happen to get that origin content. And so we need to find some way where we can think about getting content both from Filecoin storage providers, but as well as other IPFS peers where, where those are sort of equal choices. We want to, to make that more equal than, than what the IPFS gateways are serving today. We want to validate Saturn as a CDN. So we want to you know, have real traffic going through, prove out um, with, with this IPFS gateway as a customer of Saturn, that Saturn you know, is able to live up to that CDN thing on this scale of traffic. And we want to reduce the, the costs of having these central, relatively high bandwidth Equinix uh, deployments that are serving IPFS.io today. So over, over the next 15, 20 minutes, uh, this, is, this is the set of things that I'm gonna try and cover. We've talked a little bit about what is RIA. Hopefully you've got a sense of sort of the, the general uh, trajectory that, that this set of work is encompassing. I wanna talk about what we've been thinking about with trust model. I think that's, that's probably the, I don't know, hairy, but like the, the tricky set of problems is what are we trusting? Uh, what are the issues around trust that we've run into? Because that ends up being a lot of what drives design. How we're going about fetching content the performance that we've got so far and, and that we're sort of looking at. Uh, and then I'll finish by, by going uh, and connecting the various components that are getting built, what we're building, uh, to try and uh, provide some better context for, for the rest of the talks today. So let's talk about trust. When you go and get content in your web browser from IPFS today, those rendered pages that you get back are not always a thing where you can say, okay, I asked for the SID, I got back these bytes, are these bytes actually equivalent to the SID I asked for, right? I asked for a SID of like this directory, I get this nice, nice rendered HTML page showing the files in the directory, but like what's, what is my client going to do to know that that rendered HTML page actually like matches the hash of the SID that I asked for in the first place? Um, because there's been some HTML templatey thing that's applied, right? It's it, the, the SID that I asked for is not the SID of this HTML page, it's, it's of a Unix directory, and then all of this prettiness got returned in the page to make my browsing experience nice. But that's very different from actually direct content address data being returned to me. And so there's, there's then we can say, okay, well, what's different? You know, could we, could we do better? Uh, like, should I be able to verify on the client? Um, and so there's two things to think about here. One is sometimes we decorate the responses like that pretty HTML page, um, but then also we'll render a file. And so you'll potentially lose out on metadata blocks. So if I ask for a file on the gateway and I get the image back, 
The thing I'm not getting, you can look at like the car and the actual raw underlying content address data that that SID maps to. Uh, and you can see, for instance, this is a single text file. And there's three blocks in here. Uh, there's a raw block, which is the actual data. But we're rarely uh, having the gateway actually directly ask for that hash of the raw data. Instead, it's the file below that, which is this DAG PB node that contains the metadata around, OK, this is a file containing these bytes, but it has permissions and it has some metadata around it. And so that's the SID you actually get given after you IPFS add. And so if their file is large, it may actually have multiple chunks of data. So you're asking for a metadata SID that is the top of the Merkle tree of your overall data. You're getting the rendered bytes contained in that file. And from that, are you going to always be able to reconstruct back up to the SID that you asked for? So right now, you could maybe guess. Uh, our chunking isn't, in general, that smart. So you could say, OK, I'm going to try and also re-chunk these bytes I got given at every megabyte and then see if I can reconstruct what a metadata object might be and see if I can get to the same SID and I got the right response. Um, but, but you would have some false negatives. You would maybe try like at different chunks to see. And so you might be doing a lot of unnecessary computation. And in general, this seems pretty uh, sketchy as a, as a way that we would try and do it. Um, and so then there, there's also cases where you just can't, uh, where, where uh, especially if you ask for like a range request, so you get part of a file. Without getting all of the file, how are you going to know what that top hash is going to be? Because you haven't been given sort of enough of the middle pieces, only the bytes of the file, uh, to actually efficiently have any chance of reconstructing up that this is really the right part of the movie that you were asking for. The other thing, then, is we don't have any real signal. So, so when we think about, OK, so the client gets these bytes, and the client is going to, you know, it, if we were to implement a client-side validation that it's getting the right things by, by trying to rechunk and trying to make sure it's got the right SID, we don't know the client's going to do that. We know that there's a bunch of existing clients that aren't doing that. They're just downloading. And so what they're doing by just downloading is they're implicitly trusting the gateways to render correctly, to give them only the data that they asked for. So we've ended up in a system right now where a lot of clients have implicitly put a lot of trust in protocol labs uh, or the gateway that they're using to give them the right content address data. And that limits us quite a bit in, in taking this current request flow and being able to, to make it uh, less trusted or, or switch where, where that content's coming from. This is, in particular, interesting as we consider Saturn. So Saturn, as I mentioned, is, is a couple thousand nodes, but they're, they're people who are just running a piece of software. So we don't trust them fully. Right? If I go to a specific Saturn node, how do I know that that Saturn node isn't going to give me malware back or isn't going to give me you know, some random bytes back? I don't necessarily trust a particular Saturn node to the same extent that I'm going to trust protocol labs. And so we've got some real issues in being willing to say, OK, Either we're going to give IPFS.io as like a DNS and TLS certificate to these random nodes that now can potentially ruin the reputation of the domain and serve malware on it, cause it to get added to blacklists. Um, or even if we were to do something like redirecting the HTTP with a 302 or some other way to just the IP of the specific or some other less trusted uh, domain name, You've still got the question of, OK, if I'm just doing a one-on-one -on -one browser download from some untrusted node, we've got this implicit trust that you're getting the right content in the current request paths. And we're not sure we can fulfill that uh, with what Saturn's got right now. So we've taken a couple paths towards how we're going to deal with that. Um, the first is that we're building out uh, our trustless gateway specification. Uh, and so this is. How do you get content address data from an HTTP gateway when you don't necessarily trust the gateway? Uh, and the general answer for that question is you ask for car files. Uh, you get the blocks back. We don't do the rendering anymore. And as long as you put in your accept header that you're either going, you either want to accept uh, IPLD.raw, which is going to give you the direct SID block, so the specific bytes that hash directly to that SID that you asked for, or you can ask for car which will then give you the car archive of the block of the SID and then the DAG below it, so the blocks that it points to. And so you'll get the 
specific content address blocks that you can verify they're the right blocks that you asked for. And then if you want to render it, that's now on the client. Okay? But this is a different set of requests than what we have today. Right? That, and that's worth remembering. So we can, we can build out this new pipeline and we can start promoting this type of request of, hey, you should ask for car files and verify them yourself. Because we can serve that with something like Saturn, and so we can do that more cheaply and more quickly for you. Um, but that's not the clients today. That's the clients that are going to be willing to incorporate a client library or otherwise be willing to handle getting car files and doing something with them. So for that, there's a couple things. There's some of these longer term uh, efforts that, that Adin um, and that Alex are going to show uh, in the rest of this morning about what do client side and, and sort of smarter client side libraries look like um, so that we can start to move more traffic there. But we've also got some knobs on our side, right? Um, I think if you've used IPFS.io in the past, you know some requests are not super fast. Or you get 429s of, hey, you've used too much. We can tune those. We can make it so that your experience on these implicitly trusted things isn't great, such that you're motivated, if you really want your users to be using it, to do the one that's faster and cheaper. Um, and so some combination of these knobs, of having a good path that we like, along with various pressure to make people move over, seems like our best bet at shifting traffic to something better. Um, so this trustless gateway spec, you'll hear more about it. Um, I think that that's going to, you know, there's, there's already some IPIP work. That's likely a thing that we're going to be trying to, to standardize, get community involvement on, get to something that everyone's happy with in terms of what is this way to be getting cars. Okay, you get the requests. Right now, those requests are served with Kubo with a big block cache. That's pretty expensive. What, what can we do there? This is a secondary uh, piece primarily around Filecoin uh, retrievals and cost. So if we want to be able to get Filecoin content uh, with, with that challenge that that content should be sort of a first class citizen equivalent to current IPFS nodes, we've got a few options. One is we enable BitSwap on Filecoin. And now it, it's all just BitSwap, great. It's all equivalent. Um, we could extend our BitSwap library to be able to speak not just BitSwap, but also GraphSync that Filecoin speaks or some other protocol. Um, and, and so in particular, this is that there's BitSwap, the protocol, and then there's BitSwap, the piece of software implementation that contains not only the protocol, but also a pretty significant scheduler about which nodes should I ask for uh, and when should I ask for blocks from which nodes. And that scheduler is the thing that we need to figure out. Are we, are we doing a refactor? Are we diving into that? Um, or we're going to write another scheduler above BitSwap that's able to do a higher level scheduling uh, between Filecoin protocols and BitSwap protocols. Right? Because th these are sort of like the three places that you could come in and say, how are we, how, where are we doing this extension? We're either, we're, we're either going in or we've got some place that we're going to have to have extensibility. Uh, the current approach has been to use Lassie. Um, Hannah talked about this two days ago. Um, which is going to be that higher level scheduler. Uh, and in some sense, you look at that and you're like, okay, so you're adding another layer of complexity. Is this really going to make our lives better? I think that, that, that is a hypothesis that we're, we're hoping that we introduce something that's a little bit simpler as that layer, and then we can iterate on BitSwap, um, but not in the critical path. Um, where is Lassie finding out about peers then? Uh, are we doing that through BitSwap still? Um, we're, we're currently using IPNI, the network indexers, as a way to offload that peer discovery part. Uh, it reduces the need for all of these thousand Saturn nodes to be querying the DHT all the time uh, or to stay connected on BitSwap all the time to as many peers. Um, there, was, there was a description of, of sort of what this looks like from Mossy yesterday in the content routing uh, track that goes deeper. But the basic structure here um, is that when you hit IPNI with a query who has a given SID, um, it then scatters it out to a few things. It's got a local database called store the index um, that is stuff that's been published into IPNI. It has a accelerated DHT client uh, called uh, Cascade DHT um, that already has a full DHT routing table and so is able to do a one-hop query of someone who uh, has that part of the, the DHT space to ask them 
Uh, so it's able to do that reasonably efficiently for a DHT query. Um, and then it has uh, a piece of software that we built uh, over the last month, uh, thanks to Mossy also, called Cassette, that stays connected to a set of bit swap peers and, and sort of cascades the query uh, to them. But now that happens from uh, only, I think, we've sort of got one Cassette uh, primary pure ID. So all of these 1,000 nodes appear as one query stream uh, that, that's able to batch. Uh, so you get a bit swap uh, want have with, you know, that second worth of all of the SIDs that various peers want. Um, and, and that's then the, the way that it cascades back when, when content isn't available either through IPNI or to the DHT. Um, the, the sort of high level of what Lassie is doing is it gets in requests for a DAG. Um, it's got a subsystem called the candidate finder that is going to, the, uh, to IPNI to, to find peers that are potentially interesting. That comes back as a stream of, of found peers. And then as these candidates come in within the scope of that session, as soon as it get, gets one for bit swap, it starts a bit swap session to begin trying to get those blocks on bit swap. Uh, if it sees them uh, over graph sync, it'll start up a graph sync uh, query to try and get them. Um, there's a little bit of session logic there of should we be duplicating? Should we, you know, okay, I started on graph sync, but it hasn't really started. Maybe we should also spin up bit swap. Um, and that's likely to evolve. This is that lo level above the bit swap scheduler. Uh, and so that's, that's likely going to, uh, as we add complexity there, we'll be able to potentially then remove it from the bit swap layer. So that's the basic structure of what's going on in these nodes. The nice thing here, uh, and this is really just reiterating a lot of what Hannah was saying um, in introducing Lassie two days ago, is that we're doing less sort of stable state ongoing traffic than what previously has been happening uh, on Kubo uh, in, in this Nginx Kubo deployments. We don't have a 200 gig block store that we're maintaining and paying for storage on. Um, and uh, we, we aren't sort of needing to stay connected to all of the bit swap peers for performance uh, is, is the hope longer term, that these are just doing retrievals uh, and are able to be a little bit uh, lighter weight, uh, essentially. So we can, we can look at sort of what that looks like in terms of caching and performance to see where we are right now. Um, just to, to provide sort of a, a basic diagram of comparison of what these request flows look like. Um, I think this is, this is sort of a useful thing. The top line is what we have today, right? You're, you as a client, you hit the Nginx Kubo in an Equinix data center, which then goes back to the origin potentially or hits it or is able to serve from cache locally. The, the middle line, is how this changes for the current request flow. So the client is going to hit a lightweight Bifrost, pro Bifrost proxy, which is going to validate responses from Saturn and render them in the same way that you've got them today. Saturn is going to fetch it and return the cars back to that Bifrost proxy um, and then get it from the origin when it needs to. The bottom one is for new verifying clients that'll be able to go to Saturn directly. So they'll directly get this car file from Saturn. And so you'll be able to skip having to go through these PL-operated centralized uh, Bifrost proxies. In terms of caching, um, when we look at the system today, that Nginx and Kubo nodes are, are, being, are able to cache something on the order of 70% of traffic, is, is terminating directly uh, at the data center and not going back to origin uh, nodes, right? So, so that's, that's sort of like, when, when we look at our, our request distribution, a majority of traffic right now looks sort of like you go to the CDN and the CDN serves it out of cache. Um, we expect in, that, in the lighter weight proxy, we may keep some load balancing pro, uh, cache. It'll be relatively small. We can hope for maybe 30% cache rate of the very most popular requests, but we're not gonna have large amounts of storage uh, like a Kubo block store. So we don't expect that we're gonna be able to reconstruct or want to reconstruct all 70% of traffic there. We're not gonna have terabytes and terabytes of, of cache storage anymore. That's pretty expensive. Um, however, what we hope is that the, the Saturn L1 caches, which are relatively beefy caches in this decentralized CDN, are going to be able to be a caches. And so we're gonna be moving that where it's the Saturn nodes that act as that cache, uh, either uh, in the untrusted or trusted cases. Um, right now we're seeing on the order of 60% cache hits uh, on them. So it's a little bit less in terms of how we're doing it. We'll see if that goes up over time to, to be equivalent to what we've got right now with Nginx and Kubo. 
the storage is enough that it should be. And so it's a matter of, are we doing the right things to match that current caching? Um, here's here's uh, just a couple days, like graphs over the last week of, of what we're seeing on caching. Um, and so this is splitting apart that 70% uh, that I was showing you before. The, uh, because that is two systems. There's an NGINX load balancing cache. That's getting maybe 30%-ish. And so that's why we expect to continue to have around 30%-ish. That top level NGINX thing is a relatively small HTTP cache and 404 cache and that sort of thing. Um, and, then, and then you've got the Kubo block store cache, which is the, the bulk of it. Um, and so the, this is where those two numbers are coming uh, from, right? So you've got 30% yes, and then of the remaining 70% no, you've got about a 60% yes. And so if you multiply those out, you get a 70% overall cache. When we look at um, where Saturn nodes are from uh, the Bifrost endpoints, this is from our New York data center. Uh, just sort of, okay, where, if we were to ping all of these different Saturn nodes, where are they? How far away are they? The relevant thing here is the bottom ones are under 50 milliseconds. We've got a set of nodes that are pretty close. And so that's the hope, is that we're not adding much more in that two-phase uh, unverified traffic requests um, than the closest Saturn nodes. We want most of the traffic from these Bifrost gateways to go to a CDN endpoint that's near them. Right? And this is, this is supporting the current uh, traffic stream. When, you're, when you are your own node, you're of course going to go to the closest Saturn node, and so you're going to get that low latency, hopefully. Um, but if you're going to IPFS.io and getting a rendered file where we can't offload you directly to Saturn, then we're going to have to go to Saturn, get the car, render it into the file. And so we want to know how much additional latency that's going to add. Um, right now, for the, for the performance stuff, we've got a pretty smooth request distribution uh, across the Saturn nodes. And the, one of the things that we're working on tuning is seeing how aggressively we can have requests go just to the closest CDN nodes. There's a tension here between if we send all of our traffic to the one node that's closest to us, we now potentially have that node fall over and need to make sure we hot swap very quickly. Um, but also there's some questions around you know, fairness, making sure that we're properly incentivizing Saturn. So that, that has been a uh, conversation that you'll hear more of from the Saturn team about sort of this, this tension of a customer clearly wants the lowest latency, uh, whereas you also want to incentivize the growth of your network in addition to uh, optimizing the current customer. So what, what are we building? Um, I've given you sort of these block diagrams. I'll finish by sort of making sure that I attach names that you can talk to uh, and try and talk to about the people who are doing these various things so you know who to ask questions about. You first hit this proxy gateway uh, on the current request flow called Bifrost Gateway. Lytle uh, is going to talk more uh, and provide a deep dive after lunch about that component and what that looks like. Uh, a bunch of that code has been pulled out of Kubo and now lives in Boxo. So Boxo slash gateway is a package that does all of the HTTP semantics of how are we going to render the final file. This, this Bifrost gateway combines that code with a library called Caboose that Arsh is going to talk about. And Caboose is a front-end client library for Saturn that's going to choose which Saturn node gets content pulled from. So it's, it's basically maintaining a state of nearby nodes and routing requests with failover uh, for which Saturn and uh, CDN endpoint should get them. On the Saturn L1 node, uh, which is Filecoin Saturn slash L1 node as a code repository, um, that is integrating Lassie um, uh, in order to then pull contents from origins. Lassie is using IPNI, which has these components of Cascade DHT and Cassette as part of the lookup of who has content. Here's a couple more sort of deeper diagrams of that. Um, the, the first one of these you'll find on the Bifrost Gateway readme that is the, the set of requests and, and uh, semantics that that uh, proxy server expects to handle. Uh, and the second one is then Lassie and, and the, the sort of the general request flow uh, of how Lassie is expecting to get content. So where are we right now? Um, we currently have uh, on the order of 30% of our production traffic being mirrored through this new system to validate that we're able to handle it at scale. Um, the, the sort of current piece that we're working on uh, is rolling out these verifiable car requests to Saturn um, 
and, and validating that we're always getting back the right responses and that we're asking for the right things. So this is a change in Bifrost Gateway and in uh, Boxo slash Gateway. Uh, previously, when attached to Kubo, you had a block store. And so you'd ask for blocks as you needed them. And as you got specific blocks you didn't have, Kubo would then spin up BitSwap to ask for those blocks. And so it was an iterative process. Now we need to have something more declarative where you figure out what is the shape of the data that I'm likely to need to serve this whole request and ask for a single car of that. So we're tuning that to make sure we're asking for the right things from Saturn. Um, uh, we're currently fetching the car that we need into a local block store for the scope of that request and then able to serve it. Um, what we want to be able to do, uh, and so this is the work that's going on in Bifrost Gateway, uh, is to also understand sort of the walk and the shape enough that if we get part of the response, we're able to make another car request for what we are lacking rather than falling back to just the blocks that we don't have. So right now we, we've got enough to know the shape of the overall thing that we need, but if we get part of the response and then are we able to subtract that and figure out a single next request that we need to make as opposed to all of the individual blocks. And that's where it gets a little tricky. Uh, we're probably not, I think, expecting to get that fully solved of always being able to ask for one more thing of the full remaining weirdly shaped remainder, um, but we should be able to do better than we are now. Uh, in Caboose, Caboose is currently, so this is which Saturn node do we uh, talk to. Right now, we've got a stable hash ring, so different parts of the SID space are being uh, routed to uh, different Saturn nodes that are close by. Um, we're currently using uh, a dynamic set of nodes that we've heard about recently uh, that we think are potentially uh, near us, and we change their weights of how much of the requests they're getting based on how well they're performing. Um, what we'd like to do uh, is reduce that churn, because right now that means that there's some fraction that are sort of trial nodes. So we, we hear about someone we don't know if they're good, we add them with a small slice of, of requests to see if they're good, and then weight them down or weight them up based on how well they perform. But that means some of our production requests are going to a node that's potentially pretty far away. We'd like to get rid of that so that all of our requests go to close by known good nodes, and then we maybe mirror some of the traffic to some trial nodes to see if we should include them. Um, the work within Lassie, so this origin fetch uh, component, um, currently um, we've been identifying places where we're overfetching. So if, if we get asked for you know, blocks, are we going to prefetch additional blocks, expecting that those will also be asked, um, and other cases where we've ended up having more load back to origins than we were expecting to make sure we're doing the right fetches that we intend to be. Um, I think we're, at this point, largely happy with the amount of traffic that we're generating from Lassie. Um, and so the, the next piece of work that that component is working on is including an HTTP transport alongside BitSwap uh, and GraphSync so that we can uh, fetch from uh, a set of HTTP trustless gateway providers. Um, there have been a couple origins that have said that it's much cheaper for them to serve an HTTP gateway than a BitSwap uh, origin. And so we want to support that as well using the same trustless gateway spec. Um, if you want to see more about where things are and how they progress over the next month, um, there is a public Notion page uh, that is uh, extremely detailed with uh, all of the specific uh, line items that are happening each week. Uh, you're welcome to follow that with whatever level of uh, detail you wish. Um, it, uh, at its most, is probably too much information for any of us, but it, it does contain uh, a really detailed progress uh, in public of how this effort is going. So that's what I've got to say about Rhea. 